from fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. This is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. If you have a question to ask for good advice to give, come on over to podtherapy.net and join our conversation. Today on the show, we have a special guest therapist, as you've probably heard, who will help us answer some questions, and we will announce the new president of the Pennsylvania chapter for the Pod Therapy Fan Club. And now, broadcasting from Level 9 Studios, that guy is Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. It's Therapy Thursday, and it's time for some pod therapy. <laughs> I love that she still said, I'm Nick Tangeman. Yeah. Yes. I like this version of Nick Well better. done. Yes. Do you think they believed it, that I'm Nick Tangeman? I do. I, yeah, I think yeah. most people probably If I do. closed my yeah. eyes, I could not tell the difference. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, That's scary. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, Nick, uh, who is our special guest? Okay. So, our special guest is uh, Whitney Lewis, LCSW, uh, yes. licensed clinical social worker, here professional identity thief, as we just heard. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a, a real woman thing. of many talents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she has stolen stolen your identity, Nick. Open up a uh, credit. <laughs> Go buy a house. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, she is our guest therapist today. So, she's going to stick around, answer some questions, and uh, help us out with the show Very so this cool. will be uh this will be exciting so uh i guess to get started we should kind of introduce whitney to our listeners yeah um so you are originally from the great state of texas yes what the yep. stars and stripes are bright at <laughs> night deep in the oh. heart of texas <laughs> Damn it, i missed it yeah that's because you're from <laughs> iowa and you don't understand us which part of texas are you from <laughs> Dallas area. I grew up in Grand Prairie, Texas. Oh, very cool, mm-hmm. man. I'm from Waxahachie. Really? Yeah, man. That's awesome. <laughs> That's really cool. That's really cool. <laughs> Waxahachie is about the population of this studio. Yeah. So three people and uh, basically Scott walking around with a camera. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's essentially it. I Box guess. actually also has catfish. That, that's pretty Cat- much it. I Wait. didn't know you were from Texas. I am. Well, kind of. I'm from lots of places. <laughs> but I lived two years in Waxahachie, Texas. Trust me, it counts. Trust it me, does. it counts. It, it is in does. Tornado Alley. It I is. have survived some stuff. <laughs> that's awesome, though. So how long were you in Texas? Um, I have been in Texas until I went to school. I went to my undergrad and to get my undergrad degree in um Washtenaw Baptist University in Arkansas. Cool. Arkadelphia, Arkansas. Ah, that's a that's a thing. Arkadelphia. Arkadelphia. That yeah. feels Shout like out. you're making that up. <laughs> I wish I were. God, I wish I was better at geography because I really want to call BS. Somebody is listening in Arkansas. Like I am not going to stand for this. Arkadelphia is a real thing. Yep. And uh, student athlete, right? I was. I played uh, college soccer. So wow, mm-hmm. wow. Yep. That's really exciting. Yep. I I didn't. <laughs> I um I was a mathlete, hey, except not that counts. except not good at math. So, <laughs> so Whitney, what um so you you finished school? What yep. got you interested in being a therapist? Um, well, I actually have a piece of paper from when I was twelve years old that I filled out in school, and it asked, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And I put psychiatrist. <laughs> nice, <laughs> really? um, not nice. really knowing the difference at the time. I still don't know the difference. You know, <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> um, not really knowing the difference between uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, so mm, okay. therapist. Mm-hmm. So at that young of an age, what made you like that idea? Uh, my younger brother saw a, he was ADHD, Mm -hmm. still is, I guess, still ADHD. (laughs) Um, and he saw a lot of professionals. And so Ah. just experiencing that really, I don't know, sparked an interest, obviously. (laughs) Very cool. Very cool. Is there a, a, a population in your professional work that you've tended to focus on? Uh, yes, I have, uh, since my clinical internship here in Las Vegas, I've been mainly focused on working with juveniles who sexually offend. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've been adjudicated or found guilty for some sort of sexual offense, and they are ordered by the judge to complete treatment yeah. in order to stay off a sex offender registry as mm-hmm. an adult. And uh, we work through that with them and what led them to their um, sexual acting out. So not to dig too deep into their profile, but I think the listener probably doesn't always understand. And I know that a lot of folks, when they hear sex offender, um, a whole lot of stereotypes jump into their mind. But it's important, I think, to humanize that population. Explain. These are kids. These are kids who are struggling. Is there a a pattern that you notice in their personal history, maybe some trauma background or anything that 
just shows up an awful lot? Absolutely. So um, a lot of adolescents who sexually offend have been sexually abused themselves. Um, You can see that through uh, when they open up to you, if you can get them to open up to you. Sure. Trust Uh, is probably hard to earn. Yes. Adolescents have a hard time opening up to adults and trusting adults. Um, So, yeah, they um, have usually have a history of of themselves being sexually abused. And Uh. at times they may act out what was done to them. Yes. And that's a big, huge misunderstanding. People don't understand that a lot of times people who become offenders have been offended themselves. They've often been the victim of a crime. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. One of the things, too, that is kind of interesting with that is that that's a population that I hear a lot of times people will say, I'll never work with sex offenders. Right. I remember when I was in college and we were talking about that because one thing that's interesting about when you go to school for therapy or counseling or something like that, mm-hmm. um, everybody is all in school together. But then once you graduate and you find uh, jobs, everybody kind of spreads out. And, and you could be doing geriatric work. Right. You could be doing adol- working with adolescents. You substance can, like abuse. Like me, substance abuse. Right. And you kind of scatter. There's so yeah. many different areas. Yeah. But I remember in graduate school, some folks talking about like populations that they absolutely won't work with. Yeah. And that was a big one, which for me is kind of frustrating because right. – if you're getting into the field and you're saying right off the bat, I will not work with these right. people, yeah. you're really shutting yourself out. Like yeah. you, could, yeah. you could have something great to offer right. that population, but right, right off the bat, you're now saying you're not going to do it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That would be problematic for sure. Yeah. Were there yeah. any um, – are there any kind of uh, stereotypes or things that you hear? Like when you tell people <laughs> that you work with juvenile yeah. sex offenders and you yeah. do therapy with that, what kind of reaction do you usually get? Uh, the initial reaction, if it's not another therapist I'm talking to, right. is <laughs> is shock usually. Yeah. Um, and the next question is usually, how do you work with mm. those people those or that, people. that right. type of, of population? Mm-hmm. And to me, I think it was challenging at first, um, but I got into it and chose to pursue that avenue based on uh, my own personal belief that if I'm not mm. uh, putting myself in uncomfortable situations or challenging situations, mm. then I'm not really going to grow as a person or a therapist. Mm. And so for me, it was if I can work with adolescent males who have acted out sexually and talk to them about their sexual fantasies, um, their sexual behaviors, how they view uh, people they are attracted to. Mm-hmm. If I can do that, then I can work with any population. <laughs> <laughs> very true. I think yeah. it's very true. And, and you know, to Nick's point, whenever he said when we were all in our grad schools and working on these things, it was very common for people to say, you know, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do that. And then you get out and you scatter. And, you know, it's neat to see people specialize, though, in a discipline like you specialize in juvenile sex offenders. Nick yeah. specializes in substance abuse addiction. I specialize in equine therapy, um, counseling the horses. Oh, yeah. 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 Insurance not paying well for this. <laughs> they should. It's really getting ridiculous. They you should know. pay for that. Yeah. If you want these horses to perform in the race, send them to my office. <laughs> okay. I'll be the whisperer and okay. uh, very generous hour. I, I don't know. It sounds like a scam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's it's a scam. <laughs> no, no, no. Please don't misunderstand. Entirely a scam. Yeah. Come on down to therapy.vegas. <laughs> Book Jim today. But one thing they said that was really kind of a, a really good point was that, and I've heard this from other people who work in that field that say that there's kind of this shock factor when you first get into it because mm-hmm. actually i my my very first internship that i ever did was in my bachelor's in psychology and mm-hmm. it was working with juvenile sex offenders oh wow i yeah. didn't know that <laughs> yeah and uh it was it was interesting because like the very first week i was like like it just white face oh yeah jaw on yeah. Shore. Yeah, like i was like oh my god yes. like, what, what have i, I done? gotten myself yeah. into <laughs> very but uncomfortable then, the first yeah. week <laughs> but then after yeah. being in there for a year yeah you know then you know new kids come in and and they're like you know they're hesitant they don't want to open up and they don't yeah. want to talk yeah. and you kind of want to say you don't but you kind of want to say to them like Look, there is nothing at this point that right. you're going to tell me that, that I haven't I heard. I have said that so many times. I've heard it all. Right. You know, no reason to be ashamed. I've I've heard yeah. it all. Yeah. <laughs> and, and once you get through that, I, I agree. I think you should push yourself as a therapist. You should mm-hmm. work. You yeah. shouldn't. It's good to be aware of what everybody's soft spots are. Right. 
so I know that some people uh, that I, I went to graduate school with were, you know, they've been through certain things themselves, and they said, you know, I just I can't deal with yeah. with uh, perpetrators of domestic abuse because right. I was a victim myself. I've through it, and like that makes yeah. sense to me. But for yeah, the most absolutely. part, I think it's good to push yourself outside your comfort zone and work with populations that you find yourself uncomfortable with. Because yes. you're right, it, Whitney's absolutely right. Once you've done that, mm-hmm. then it's like, oh, I. I well, feel really what's good. neat in both of your backgrounds about that population is you explored that during your internship. Yes. And for there, a lot of our listeners are actually aspiring therapists. They're people that are enrolling in college programs or graduating them or navigating them. Yeah. And for all you folks out there that are interested, your internship is really that time of self-discovery. And you're really supposed to get out there and, and, and you know encounter new populations, encounter different kinds of supervisors and be challenged. Otherwise, you never know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. You know. But when you meet these kids, you hear sex offender. You go, oh, my goodness. I don't mm-hmm. know if I can do this. But they're just kids. They just want to play Mario. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. And they just want to go play tag. And yeah. They're just kids. And they're almost always kids that have been hurt. Yes. They're victims more than anything. Yes. And they're acting out that victimization in a direction – because they don't know what else to do with it. Absolutely. And I know perfectly, you know, successful 45-year-olds who wouldn't know what to do if they were the victim of something. Yep. They probably would re-traumatize and act it out too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a saying that we use in therapy a lot, which is that hurting people hurt people. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. very common. So if you've yeah. ever met a kid out there, folks, or you know anybody who, you know, has acted in ways that are sort of scary or inexplicable – Always assume that there's some pain in their history and, you know, approach with some generosity of spirit, I think, is a huge takeaway. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. That is exactly what I would reinforce as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And if there's a horse in your life that needs therapy. Mm-hmm. Send him to Jim. Come on down. <laughs> I, I would love to have that as a guest. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Ed, tell us. I don't us. know. The way this podcast goes, <laughs> there's, that's, we're not going to rule that out. We should start claiming that there point. was a horse in the room. During all episodes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure you've had some success stories. Mm. Some. Yeah, definitely. Um, the challenge I have is that once they complete therapy with me, they don't usually want to come back and see me. Because <laughs> <they've, laughs> they were court ordered? Yeah, yeah, they were court ordered. They've talked about very personal things. Sometimes right. I use that as a tool to get them to open up that mm. – I am essentially a stranger to them. Mm. I have no reason to judge them, and you never have to see me again to like to relive mm. um, the things you've shared with me. Mm. So I th- think sometimes that's valuable to them. Yeah, right. I guess some clients do come back and stop by to say hi from the group home I worked in, but mm. um, generally they would rather leave it in the past. They're trying to move forward. So. so what is what is the success rate? When you think about kids that go into care, they, they go through this therapeutic experience, they're committed to the work, mm-hmm. they're adequately supported. Mm-hmm. Is the prognosis good or are they almost always going to still find trouble? I think the prognosis is good. There is a lower rate of recidivism or mm. of it happening again. Mm-hmm. If the client or if the perpetrator has been through treatment and completed the process of thinking through why they did what they did and how they can gain tools to help them manage their behaviors and their thoughts in the future. Yeah. And that's one thing actually that I found really interesting because I've looked at some of the data and some Mm. of the statistics. And as an addictions professional, I wish we had those results. Right. Which is really interesting because I think a lot of people, when they think of sex offenders, they think, oh, they're always going to be like that. Yes. There is no recovery for them. They may as well just write them off. They're no good. Yes. But as an addictions professional, I'm like, no, like that's like, I wish I could produce results. Right. (laughs) Yes. Sex offender therapy can produce results. Gosh. And, you know, if I can get on my soapbox for a second, since we're on this topic, one of the things that publicly has kind of bothered me, and, and I'm like this with everything, if you're, you know, using stereotypes to talk about people that live with addiction, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to have a problem with that, you know, and, yeah. and if we're talking about it in a non generous way and we're using medical language, um, like addict or, you know, like, you know, somebody that's addicted to heroin or something like that, and we're not, a treating them in a medical capacity and we're just criminalizing them. Mm-hmm. I have a real problem with that. And I've honestly had a big beef with this concept of sex offense. Right?